Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Blood Whisperer radio show, coming to you live from the Congaree National Park in beautiful South Carolina, USA. We're going to be discussing the wonderment, the beauty, and the awesomeness of our beautiful, beautiful feathered companions. We're also going to have fantastic guests on to share their beautiful moments, experiences, and perhaps maybe a little bit of help and advice to come your way to make your relationship between you and your bird so much better. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Diana Larson. She is the founder and the director of Snuttles Hut Parrot Rescue in Norway, Michigan. We're very honored and very happy to have you with us tonight. And I'd like to start out with, uh, first of all, Diana, if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you got into birds. Well, I had birds when I was young. It started out actually with a racing pigeon that my father had found in the desert and he the bird had a broken wing i ended up taking the bird in and he lived with me for like nine years that's awesome go ahead and then later on i wanted a cockatiel my sister had given me two cages so i went to the local pet store and picked up a simple gray cockatiel and he was with me for a few years. And I see now that you've you've definitely graduated into some larger birds. Uh, I have. Well, you want to tell me a little bit about them? What you got? I have. There are four cockatoos here currently. Uh, we have Wally, who is my midnight rescue. And he's an umbrella cockatoo. He's probably about 27 years old now. Wow. When you say midnight rescue, what 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 do you mean by that? Well, I got a call in the middle of the night from a friend of my brother's that uh, she was cussing and swearing like a sailor because this bird had been dropped off at her ex-husband's house who lived right next door. No cage, no food. The man had a pack of pugs that were known and proven bird and deer killers. Marvelous. Uh, Yeah. And this poor bird got dropped off in just a, a little carry cage. So you went over there and you saved his life. I did. Well, bless your heart. Thank you for thank you for stepping up and doing that. Tell me a little bit more about the other residents, uh, other bird people, if you will, trapped in bird clothing uh, that you have there. You have some really cool stories about them. I have some really sad stories about them. Uh, Conan is my lesser sulfur crested cockatoo and he came in about a year after Wally did, after my U2. And uh, he, he was in a real sad situation. The family that owned him tried to starve him to death. And then they sent him to the guy that I got him from. And this guy had him on an all seed diet loaded with sunflower seeds for over a year before contacting me. And when he contacted me, I hopped into my crippled van at the time and made the four-hour trek and picked the bird up and brought him home. And, of course, got him into the vet right away because when I first saw him, I was thinking liver disease. He had scissors beak so bad he couldn't eat. He, uh, He looked horrible. He looked horrible. And the vet did some blood work, and it turned out he was just malnutrition. So we did a couple beak trims with him, and he's happy as anything can be now. Oh, you still have him then? He's still with you? Oh, oh he's with me for life. Ah, I like the sound of that. All four of my cockatoos are with me for life. So you have four, okay. I have four. I have two citron crispits also. Oh, okay. They're beautiful. So let me ask you this. Do you have them right where they want you? Of course. Then you're doing it right. I have no wrapped around their talons that isn't. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I love it when I walk 
into the bird room, and Wally looks at me and says, Hi, I'm a cockatoo, give me a kiss. And he blows kisses at me. Oh, that's totally precious. Totally precious. What and other... he tells me what he wants to eat every day. Such as? Uh, well, he'll, if he wants a peanut butter sandwich, he'll say, I want peanut butter. Okay. Two days ago, now, my birds have been on a vegetable kick lately. I couldn't get them to eat fruits. They were throwing their fruits at me. And the other day, I went in to let them know that I was making their vegetables, and he looked at me and said, I'm tired of vegetables. Whoa. Yeah. This <laughs> <laughs> <I> is <says>, okay. <laughs> I love it. I love so. it. Well, what's it? What, okay. Go ahead. He comes up with some of the funniest things, and what he says he means. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, they, they definitely, uh, many of those cute little darling spirits trapped in bird clothing, if you will, they know exactly. A lot of people think, uh, well, people that really aren't exposed to birds, so to speak, or, or uh, have the love and the spirit for birds think, oh, well, they just mimic, they just copy. And part of that is true, but the bigger part of it is, is that they've also at the same time they learn how to be able to get what they want by listening to us i love it absolutely you know i just i love where, it where he got the untired of vegetables from i have no clue wow that's just fantastic but he he let me know that as plain as day so of course i had to defrost some frozen fruits for him <laughs> oh, okay. I was waiting for the punchline there. I was gonna go. Okay, now what did you do? <laughs> did you did you call the counselor and go, hey, wait a minute, man. I've got a bird here. It's ready to change me from a a, a rooster to a hen in a heartbeat. And what am I gonna do here? <laughs> you know. Oh, well, people love hearing the stories about my animals. They'll actually they'll call or they'll come over, not so much to visit with me, but to see what's gonna happen next. Ah. Oh. Okay. Let me ask. It's so funny. Let me ask you this: Do you? I, I asked you earlier regarding if you had any memorable, memorable moments, uh, positive ones regarding your bird. Certain things that that stood out in your heart or in your mind that you'd just simply never forget that you'd like to share. Oh, there's quite a few of them, Michael. There is. Um, I had a, a military macaw here that uh, is owner had gotten depressed and surrendered him to me and of course when she came out of her depression i did give him back to her um i was i was hanging some curtains and redoing my windows in my bird room i have a small four bedroom house and one bedroom is dedicated just for the birds and i was hanging these curtains and i had him in this huge macaw cage that was donated to me and i was using the one end of the cage to lay the drapes on and the blinds and everything because I was getting everything ready for the winter. And I uh, got got the plastic up and I put the blinds back up and I put the shears back up and then I put the drapes back up. And this bird comes over, he looks at the window and he looks at me and he says, See, I told you, if you'd let me do it, I'd get it done. <laughs> oh, oh my, I love it, I love it. Oh, it, it was just hilarious. Oh, I, I love my it. My prized cockatiel, Sniffles, he used to, he would, he loved the song by Dexie's Midnight Runners, Come On Eileen. Uh-huh. And he would dance through the song. And he had a cage mate, another cockatiel, her name was Louise. And if she was on the perch, he would knock her off the perch so he could dance up and down the perch. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Talk about st literally stealing the show, huh? Oh, absolutely. He was a show-off. Wow. Okay, tell me another story. Oh, let's see. There's a, There are so many of them. Um, well, Conan chasing my one dog across the living room. That was funny. I had had Conan here for about four days, and I had him out in the living room in quarantine, 
and uh, as a matter of fact, we had just had the vet visit. And I had him out of his cage, and I was kind of playing with him. You know, he was on my arm. I was playing with him. And I always secure my dogs in another room. Okay. Oh, you, my black uh, lab, okay, so my you, you have dogs. Okay. What's that? I said, oh, so you have dogs as well. I do. Okay. I do. I have right now six rescue dogs. I just had one come in last night. Holy smokes. So you 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 do uh you got a beautiful heart and you're doing a lot for the animal kingdom, not just for birds, but for the uh, for the paws uh as well, huh? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I wish I could have a farm. Oh, uh, there need to, there needs to be more people on the planet like you, Diana. So, I wish I could have a farm. Well, thoughts are things, you know, it all uh, every every reality, you know, started out with a dream. Things, you know, I mean it it all starts with a single thought, thoughts are things. You put it out there, and and if you, you know, you you, you just got to do it. Like with myself, you know, I always thought, gee, it would really be nice to have a sanctuary and a whole bunch of birds and save their lives and stuff. And and I decided one day that you know what, in order to take and make it happen, I just had to simply do it. And right. I, and I did. I made the decision. I walked away from a career in marine biology and computer sciences, and it was the best decision I ever made when I decided to step up for something, an, a, another being, if you will, that doesn't is not equipped with the tools to be able to take and, say, survive in the chaos of being around human beings. And that was actually within a moment that's when I suddenly realized that there truly is a difference between living and existing. I got, oh, absolutely. I got more in touch with my own spirit than I ever even realized was sitting in there just simply waiting to say hello. And it was because it wasn't about me anymore. Right. You know, and I, 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 I just love it. I can't imagine myself doing doing anything else, and it appears that basically uh, you have that same kind of heart, that same kind of commitment, and once again, I I applaud you and thank you for, for being on the planet and doing what it is that you do to help the few that are in need. Um, let me ask you another question, if I might. Um, sure. what is What is it like where you live? In other words, like, what do your birds see when they're looking out the windows and things of that nature? Okay. Just outside of town, but I'm within the city limits. My house is the only house on my block, so if they look out my side windows, they see an open lot and some trees, and of course my vehicles, because that's where my driveway's at. Uh -huh. Directly across the street from me, I have a couple houses. Okay. And then Kitty Corner from me, of course, there's a couple houses there. So you said that uh, uh, earlier, you mentioned to me uh, before we started the interview that you live in Norway, Michigan. Uh, Correct. It, do you have brutal winters there? Oh, yes. Lots of, oh, yes. Lots of snow? We, we, uh, we got hit with snow last Sunday so bad I could not even get out of my house. Oh, my goodness. It's 84 degrees here today. I can't imagine it's still snowing. Okay, I'm coming to move in with you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> For real? Us? Oh. Okay, let me Actually, ask Actually, today wasn't a bad day. Today we, today we had a heat wave. We got into almost 90 degrees. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's almost ready to take and put on the, uh, the, uh, the sunblock, huh? <laughs> but not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, it's still kind of sweater weather here. Oh, jeez. But... Uh, what do your birds? What do your birds think when they see snow? Have you ever noticed them acting any certain way? Like when they look out the window and all of a sudden, here's everything is all covered in white and all. Do they ever? They're show... a lot quieter. Really? They're a lot quieter. They don't like the snow. Oh. Why would you say that they don't like it? I'm just kind of curious. Just as quiet as they get. You know, they don't even interact with me as much when it's snowing. Oh. I know the first time that it snowed uh, out in the Mendocino Forest before I came here to South Carolina, I was it was uh, New Year's Day, uh, got a million years ago, uh, and I remember opening up the drapes, 
and uh, so that all the birds could look out into the forest and every window that you looked out of you saw trees and things of that nature and everything was just blanketed in white and every single one of my birds their pupils just like went whoa and what i got from that is well first of all they all got really super mellow but i actually felt like they all thought that perhaps maybe while they were asleep that they were transported to another planet because a lot of my birds had never ever ever even seen snow they didn't know what it was right. you know so it was definitely a comedy of errors and, and, and fun and you know and i'd take a couple of them out at a time you know just for a minute or two so they could actually you know look around you know outside and all and uh, they just they they loved it they were just totally mesmerized and uh, but as you said earlier yeah they they were really they all of them got really really super mellow and laid back and i thought it was because of the fact that they were just so overwhelmed that they had never seen anything like this and it was just like going to the state fair when you're a kid man for the very first time and getting your first you know uh cotton candy you know and or the candy apple and stuff and uh you know they were just i don't know they to me it just seemed like they really really loved it i want to ask you this you've been working with birds for many many years you you've seen the best side of birds you've seen the worst side and i'm regarding uh, i'm talking about people that like you know have been really good to birds that you have and people that that haven't and right. the communicating with birds and all do you are, do you have any recommendations that you might want to share to help others to have even a better relationship with their birds certain secrets certain things that you found out that just seem to really help to open up that door of communication between you and your bird that you'd like to share the biggest thing is do your research before you bring a bird home no matter what kind of bird it is, no matter what kind of animal it is, do your research first. Okay. Do your homework. That is the biggest thing. Talk to vets, talk to pet shops, talk to rescues, talk to anybody that might know. Because a lot of the problems that I'm coming up with is people are not doing any kind of research. They go out on a whim and get this bird and find out it's not what they expected. It's a lot more work, it's a lot messier, it's a lot louder. Yeah, to suddenly realize that you have a two and a half year old with a can openers on its face and it's Absolutely never gonna and it's, a bullhorn. It's well, okay. And it's never gonna go to college. And once or twice a year, it will definitely let you know though that it wants to go to the prom. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Well, aren't cockatiels kind of like, they're in the cockatoo family, correct? They are. They're a distant cousin. A distant cousin, okay. My other brother, Daryl, yeah, all right. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, Diana, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, number one, for, for honoring us with your time tonight on our show, for being on the planet. And Michael, have, it was absolutely my pleasure. Well, you've let a lot of people know out there now who Snuddles Hut Parrot Rescue is in Norway, Michigan. Diana Larson, another one of my very close friends, awesome person, second to none, if you will. And bless your heart, and welcome to another day in our Universal Playground. And go and give all of those babies warm big kisses and big wingy hugs from all of us here at global nest and bless your heart and have an absolutely outstanding night and an even better tomorrow well thank you very much michael you too and uh you give your guys big wingy hugs and beaky kisses for me too you're on you're on and we definitely would like to have you back on too so uh absolutely i'd be more than honored to. keep that in mind and we will talk again soon. Good night, Diana, and thank you. Those of you out there that might like to help Diana out with her rescue, 
Her PayPal addy is snuddleshut at live.com. That's S-N-U-T-T-L-E-S-H-U-T at live, L-I-V-E, live.com. Thank you. We would like to extend a sincere thank you to Tom Rowdy Bush, the creator of Rowdy Bush Foods. Find out the reasons Rowdy Bush Food is the right choice for keeping your birds healthy and happy. When nutrition is important, Rowdy Bush Premium Foods are second to none. Rowdy Bush Incorporated manufactures specialized bird foods. This manufacturing is a result of research by an avian nutritionist Tom Rowdy Bush. During his 16 years of nutritional research in the Department of Avian Sciences at the University of California, Davis, Tom studied a variety of birds, including 10 years of research on the nutritional requirements of companion birds. Mr. Rowdy Bush has generated most of the published nutritional research in pet birds. As far as pellets are concerned, Rowdy Bush is what we feed our flock exclusively here at the Global Nest Exotic Bird Sanctuary. You can order from them direct. It's Rowdy Bush, R-O-U-D-Y-B-U-S-H dot com. Their telephone number is 1-800-326-1726. Thank you. Good evening, Debbie Huckabee uh, from Bop Sanctuary in Florida. And how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? I'm fantastic. I got another day on the planet. I got all my babies right where they want me, so I think I'm doing it right. <laughs> Well, that's all that matters, yeah, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to first uh, begin by asking you if you wouldn't mind telling us just a little bit about yourself and how you came to getting into birds. Well, um, I sort of inherited my first parrot about 15 years ago from my dad. And uh, it's like a Lay's potato chip. You can't have just one. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's sort of where my love came in for birds. Um, ironically, I haven't had them all my life, just for the past maybe 15 years. And then I uh, sort of fell in love with the little feathered kid and uh, started my own little collection before I moved down to Florida from Tennessee. Well, and now you have a full-fledged sanctuary and rescue. Um, what I would like to ask you now is, are there any particular mem memorable moments that you'd like to share? And I'm referring to positive ones, things that just make your heart sing when you think back on it regarding the birds that you have or the birds that you have had. Well, Michael, there have been numerous rescues through the years of birds that were in really horrendous situations birds that are, were scared of humans, that were cowering in the back of the cage, uh, living in dark closets. Each experience is always unique, and each experience brings to mind the fact that there's never enough people in rescue. There's always going to be birds in need of saving uh, from, from their elements. Um, but so many times these little these little guys 
are just cowering in fear. And all it takes are a few kind words and a few soft um, voices to bring them out of their shell and let them know that there actually are good people in the world. Everybody's not bad and all humans aren't abusive. Uh, We're not really going to save them all, but I think it's important to save every single one that we can. That's absolutely beautiful. So tell me, uh, and also the rest of the world, if you will, what is BOPS all about? What do you do? Well, we are, as the name says, Birds of Paradise Sanctuary and Rescue. Ninety percent of the birds that come into BOPS are permanent placement. We have huge aviaries where the birds are able to have free flight. There's a covered area, but there's also an open area so they can sit in the sun or they can bathe in the rain. Um, We also have an adoption program where we pre-screen potential families. And actually ours may be a little more unique than, than others because we let the bird pick the people. Um, the adoptive families have to come in on several occasions to make sure that it's a good match with the bird that they're looking at. So the birds kind of give us an indication, okay, I like this family, or they don't go home with them. That's an excellent idea. That's absolutely excellent. Let the birds decide whether or not the beautiful magic in these people's hearts that come there to want to rescue one of these guys and bring them home and make them part of the family. Um, Let me ask you this. Um, Where where you live and what it's like, um, what is it that your birds see when when they're outside? They're looking out from the aviaries and things of that nature. Kind of describe, if you would, a little bit what the surroundings are. What is it that they see from the bird's eye point of view? Well, we aptly named the sanctuary Birds of Paradise. I feel like this is our own little piece of paradise here. Where we sit on six and a half acres of former tree farm, so there's a lot of vegetation. And inside the bird's aviary, we actually plant palm trees and other vegetation so they can have it as close to their natural habitat in captivity as possible. We go up to the Ocala Forest here in Florida and bring in natural branches uh, to make as their perches. So they have a, a, a sandy bottom so they can dig in the dirt, they can climb the trees, all within the inside of their aviary. So we, we try to make it natural. That sounds absolutely beautiful, absolutely fantastic. I Before I'm ready to hide my own Easter eggs, I've got to get down there and, and see. Know, what, right? Yeah. Let me ask you, when you mentioned that you bring in branches and things of that nature, I've had people over the years um, contact me to find out basically what types of woods basically that are safe and types of woods that are not safe when it comes to toys and it comes to purchase. Do you have any particular recommendations uh, that you'd like to share with people? I I do. Um, We use uh, mostly natural um, pine for, white pine for our toys that we make and we also, like I said, go to the Ocala Forest, but you know, Google is such a wonderful tool. And all you have to do is Google bird safe wood. And it's a beautiful thing (laughs) if you have a question. You know, we have a lot of orange trees in Florida, but they're also susceptible to being treated for uh, insecticides. So you have to be very, very careful where your branches come from. If they come in from your yard and you know that they're safe and they haven't been treated, then by, by all means use those for your parrots. Um, but it's it's just very important that we be sure. And I do not recommend oak for Amazons or macaws because believe it or not, they are susceptible to oak allergies. Really? Yes, my, my avian vet actually argued that point with me for several months until I proved my theory. And he goes, okay, Debbie, you're right. 
So in Florida, and I've had this conversation with numerous people, they say, you know, why is my bird's eyes itching? Why are they getting scaly crust? And I said, because they're, they've been exposed to oak trees. So this is my remedy and vet approved. You take one tablespoon of um, children's Benadryl and add it in one gallon of water. And that's what the bird drinks uh, for uh, a week at least through the season. Why is it that you give them this? Uh, it's because of their oak allergies. Oh, because it's of the mostly, oak. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's mostly mostly in the spring and mostly in the fall when the oak pollen is um, out in full force. And the Benadryl acts as a calming agent and a soothing agent just like it does in people. Oh, okay. Well, that's a really good point that you brought up because I know a lot of people figure that, well, oak, it's a hard wood. It's something that's going to take him a call, a few minutes to be able to chew through before he drops to the bottom of the cage. And, yeah. and uh, you know, that's a really good heads up uh, that you're giving people here regarding that. I My preference basically in purchase and all is either, I either use Manzanita or Madrone. And it that seems to work. It's worked out pretty good for us in that it takes a, a, a pair at a country minute to be able to eat through that. So the perches aren't going bye bye so rapidly as using softer woods and things of that nature. Absolutely, I agree with you. Manzanita is just a little bit harder to get and a little more expensive, but, but by all means, you know, provide the best thing that you can for your parrot that's going to last a long time. Oh, you're right, in reference to getting it. Yeah, now, see, I'm on the other side of my known universe. I was in the Mendocino Forest for many, many years, and Manzanita and Madrone grow out there like weeds. It's right. it's ev right. it's everywhere, and I brought it all with me here. But after after the interview, uh, what I might be able to take and set up for you is that um, I have a number of friends out there, even people that are renting my property, uh, that have birds out there in our West Coast uh, division of our sanctuary. That could actually get you some manzanita and madrone and get it sent to you, and not have to pay a single dime for it. It, oh, that would be great. Yeah, as many babies as you have, which is approximately how many at this time? Uh, 300, 350. Holy beak! <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, it, uh, it takes a team of volunteers every day to care for these guys, and it uh, costs about $6,000 a month to uh, maintain the facility. How many volunteers do you have that come out and help you, or do they like rotate out or something? You get people for a while and then they go away, and then some other people well, come in and join in. How does that work? We do get different people. We have some snowbirds that uh, are seasonal, but we have some really diehard fanatics that are here every week and would be here every day if they didn't have to work a full time job. Oh, kind of like um, you, huh? <laughs> 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 I'm here 24-7, uh, but, uh, but that's okay because that's what I was put on this earth to do, is to save parrots. I, I, I love you and thank you so much for being on the planet. Let me ask you this. If someone would like to take, and they live in your area or close enough, uh, to where your sanctuary is and all, what are some of the requirements or hoops that they would need to take and jump through in order to take and come to your sanctuary and give you a hand from time to time? Um, we just have a volunteer application and they come in and we give them the little 50 cent tour and they fall in love a hundred times when they first get here and then of course they want to come back and spend time with the parrots. But it's, it's hard work, it really is. But it's um, it's therapeutic. I have people here with PTSD that would rather be here than any place on the planet because it helps with their anxiety. The birds have a calming effect. The birds actually are in tune with the people, with what their needs are of the day. Um, so it works out for people and birds. Is there a lot of tactile going on there? In other words, people that, that volunteer and things of that nature, do they have the option or uh, 
you know, to be able to hold them, to snuggle with them and all, or is this kind of like a, from a distance kind of thing? Well, we have both. The uh, birds that are in the aviaries pretty much just uh, remain uh, in there playing with each other and spending time together. But we do have an adoption center that houses our birds that are up for adoption. And so we encourage the volunteers to come in and spend time with those birds to keep them in a socialized mood so they are continue to be available for adoption. Excellent. So it. Yes, you can come in and snuggle with the parrots if they allow it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah. It's always up to the bird, Michael. It's, oh. it's their choices. We we don't we don't make that call for them. It's, oh. it's always up to them. Oh, I I, I I'm following you 150 percent on that. I have, you know, we don't have nearly as many as you have. We only have like 46, and most of them are macaws. And um, uh -huh. something that I realized a while back. And it really made my heart feel. It, it made my heart sing, and that it w and that is that I've got them all right where they want me. So my heart is telling me I'm doing it right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. And you know what? Um, birds are the teachers here, not the other way around. If you listen to the birds, whether they speak in human form or not. They're always trying to tell us something if you'll just be patient and listen. I love that. I'm I'm actually I'm on my sixth year now of writing a book exactly about that, and it's entitled The Unspoken Language. It's what all other animals use to communicate with one another without the need for dialogue. It's, exactly. Yeah, and. Uh, it, it's it's pretty amazing out in out in the Mendocino forest. I had two mountain lions for pets that would come and visit me every three or four months, and I'd toss them out a raw chicken or something and sit on the sidewalk and scritch their ears and their head while they're eating. And you talk about breath, some of the worst breath you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> it would make an onion cry, and then they'd kind of look up at me, lick their lips, you know, and, and stuff. Turn around, walk down the path, jump over the fence, and they're gone, and I wouldn't see them again for quite a while and I also had a little bear and I had a number of bobcats and lots of deer and all and what I discovered was that when I realized that I needed to stop listening to my head and allow my heart to say hello is when yes. it turned on for me that like a screaming jet the, their intuitiveness just flies straight through your heart it pulls everything that you are out of you in a heartbeat and at that particular time within th their spirit they make a very very quick decision of whether or not they want to say hello to you to your spirit to be part of that or they want to just go bye bye and uh, right. it, as soon as I'm able to, and I'm hoping, as I said before, before I'm ready to hide my own Easter eggs, that um, my birds can teach me how this is being done. Because one of the remarkable things that I've found is that, you know, I know that you've had birds that have come in there that have gone through holy heck with people, you know, in reference to not just yeah. not feeding them or ignoring them, but I mean physically hurting them. And yeah. I, I can take them a call that has you know been gone through all kinds of really nasty stuff really really upset wants to take you down and pull that guy to my chest and close my eyes and the first thing i do is i play a little game and the little game is simply this i imagine two hearts beating as one and it's it's amazing um debbie that you can just almost feel the air just go out of them and the relief and they stop shaking and all and allowing my heart to say Hello, I love you. You are finally home, and as long as I'm on this planet, no one is ever, under any circumstance, ever going to hurt you again. So the heart is very, very magical in this process of relating to these guys because that's what they see. They don't see what's in our head, and they don't hear what it is that comes out of our mouth, really. It's more about what's inside of that beautiful spirit that resides in each and every one of us that birds for me 
they made me realize and I say this with love and respect they made me realize a long time ago that yes there definitely is a difference between living and existing and I have them to thank for that oh absolutely I agree with you there, there's nothing um, more special than, than holding a bird to your chest and letting them fill your heart and feeling their relaxation and their knowledge that they're finally safe yeah, it's it's uh, it makes it. A, I, I revel in having another day in this universal play, playground each morning that I wake up, and I've been doing this since fifth grade. So I go far out, man. I got another day on the planet, and can't wait <laughs> to to come and, and you know to, to snuggle with all of them. I snuggle with every single one of my birds, you know, and that's it, just the way that it's always been. Debbie, I wanted to ask you something, and. Um, do you have, uh, I'm sure that you do, but I would like to share with you any recommendations that you might have to share with others to be able to have even a better relationship with their birds? I know it's a heavy-duty question, but... Um, well, no, it's, it's, it's a heavy-duty question, but it's really simple. There are two things that are most important in a relationship with a parrot. And that's your patience and listening. If you will do those two things, if you will be patient with your bird and let it come out of its shell on its own terms and listen to that, what that bird is trying to tell you because they can't tell us in, in human terms, but they can tell us in their mannerisms, in their actions, and in their little eyes, I like to say, especially a cockatoo's eyes, it's the window to your soul. <laughs> and believe it or not, they see your soul. It's just like you said before. They see a lot more in humans than we can convey to other humans because birds are very intuitive. And they know what your soul is all about, whether you show it or not. So... You know, just be patient and listen to them and try to understand where they come from rather than what you want from your bird. Let your bird tell you what they want from you, and it will be a much happier home. That's beautiful. That's fantastic. Debbie, you, your, your, your sanctuary is a nonprofit, correct, a 501c3? Yes. Okay, and, yes. and I imagine that, you know... It, in order to take in function, you know, monthly and all of that, a lot of that relies on donations. Um, do you have a PayPal addy in which people could take and help you out from time to time? Would you share that address with me, please? Uh, sure. It's uh, donate at birdsofparadisesanctuary.org. Donate at Birds of Sanctuary. BirdsofParadiseSanctuary.org. Okay. All right. Super. Did you get that, folks? All right. And ironically, we have a huge fundraiser coming up on May 1st where donations are matched by the Patterson Foundation, which is a local organization here in Bradenton. And uh, all donations will be matched. Usually that's our, our number one fundraiser of the year. It's an online fundraiser. And if you just want to uh, check out our page, our Facebook page, or our website, there will be a link for that uh, giving challenge for uh, next Monday. Okay, what is your website address for folks that don't know? It's birdsofparadisesanctuary.org. Birdsofparadisesanctuary.org. All right, mm -hmm. fantastic. Okay, peeps, well, there you go. This here, here we are with another absolutely outstanding, beautiful human being on this planet that is giving up, not giving up, she's sharing her time and her beautiful magic and beautiful soul to make it just a little bit better for those beautiful little ones trapped in bird clothing. Debbie, thank you. Thank you for being on the planet. Thank you so much for what it is that you do. Uh, I've, we've known each other for years, and I respect you 100%. And I, as I told you before, sweetheart, I've always got your back no matter what. And Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you so much. You, uh, you do the same thing in your little corner of the world, and um, all the, 
uh, earthlings on the planet appreciate you as well. Well, we're, we're, we're doing our best, you know, we're, do, we're doing our best, and that's the beauty of it. We can't do any more than that. All right, once again, I definitely would like to have you back. I know that your schedule is pretty much like mine. Uh, you know, uh, I wake up in the morning feeling single and seeing double and, and, and talking bird, you know, <laughs> and, and all. But I definitely, I, I definitely want to get you back there. And uh, hopefully um, the people that are aware now of your website and your PayPal Addy to donate and also the, in the coming month of May that the donations are going to be matched uh, by the foundation that you're affiliated with there. And folks, step up, okay? Step up and, and do this because these are one of the, Debbie is one of the people on this planet that's actually doing it right. She's doing it with love, she's doing it with integrity, and she loves them and she cares about them. So if you want to take and a few dollars basically and not drink that mocha for a couple of days and send it to someone basically that can make your donations, your heart and your feelings go so much farther and do so much more, then please do not hesitate. Help this beautiful person out, her beautiful sanctuary, and the beautiful babies that she has there now, but also not to mention the ones that are still out there that need her love and her attention and her caring. Debbie, thank you so very, very much for being with us tonight, and welcome to another day on the planet, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Michael, and thanks for having me on the show. Thanks, everybody, and if anybody wants to reach out, I'm on Facebook. You can just uh, give me a shout, and I'll help you if I can. Fantastic. All righty. Good night, and thank you. Good night. Good night. IQ Air, the number one rated room air purifier for allergies and asthma. The IQ Air Health Pro Plus has received more top reviews and awards than any other air purifier. At IQ Air, we are committed to providing you with the best air purifiers in the world. We back it up with this simple 100% straightforward warranty. We ensure that your IQ Air Health Pro system meets or exceeds our quality guarantee. We also guarantee that your system is free from defects or we will fix or replace it for free. This includes everything. All you have to do is register your product within 30 days of purchase to be eligible for our 10-year limited warranty. This is our simple promise. We stand 100% behind our Swiss-made air purifiers so you can relax and breathe easy. IQ Air, I-Q-A-I-R, IQAir.com. Order yours today. Also, you can give us a call at 1-866-488-1918 to talk to our indoor quality experts. Thank you.